morning and welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied hands, Quindy, Justin, and John. How is everyone on this happy day for you Americans, that happy day before Thanksgiving, where we all get a little time off? Hey, Jenner. Long time no see. Hello, everybody else. Hello, hello. Pendrick, you know, sometimes your ideas are great. Like, you totally missed yesterday when I totally used your idea to like do different color blue and I gave you total cred for it to do different colors of blue on the front of Darius. But then you come in and say things like, let's give him clay feet. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's everybody. We all have wonderful ideas followed by kind of like, really? Ideas. If we all only had good ideas all the time for that everybody else thought were good, like life would be pretty boring. But yes, you should write, you should paint yours like it's clay. Actually, if you painted this entire model like it was actually a terracotta golem, that would rock. <laughs> that was, that would rock. You should be sorry for not showing up yesterday when I used your idea. You should be sorry for that totally. You should not be sorry for suggesting feet of clay. You should just go out and paint a clay golem, like I said. You could even put cracks on it. That'd be pretty cool, actually. Well, I'm thinking of, like the terracotta warriors, like the Chinese terracotta warriors, the army of, uh, clay clay warriors you could do that with this guy you do i do they, do they they've got clay golems but they look like the hulk don't they at least reapers did <laughs> hello hello everyone yeah hello chromatic miniatures yeah so we're working on this guy today um i think i'm really getting to the point where i want everything i want to tackle the back i think and get everything kind of locked in um, in the process of that, if you guys have any questions about what we have done so far on this model, let me get focused. Focused. So last time, remember, we did we did introduce purple down on the leather. Yeah, terracotta would be pretty awesome on this model. Um, but uh, we did we did go purple on the leather. We just understated it so it wasn't too much purple. I didn't want it to be too distracting. Um, but today, like, there's a lot on this model that we haven't even blocked in. And so I kind of want to get the back going on here now uh, so that we can work on stuff. So on the left, by the way, you see, like, kind of the finished out, like, under under stuff, like his actual hands, suggesting it's a just slightly different treatment of metal. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're going to work on this today, I think. Because I'm, it gets to a point where I'm sick of seeing unpainted parts of the model and I at least want to get the basics down so that we... We look good on camera. Um, did I leave my ancient oak somewhere? I thought I had it out the other day. Wilderness. Dragon. Oh, no. I may have taken it into the other room. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. So let me uh, let me skedaddle for a second and get the color that we are undercoating our bronze with. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I want to, like, totally make the model look silly, Pedre. Silly. It. He would look pretty silly with clay feet. Plus, he would have like the ultimate Achilles heel. Like, just break the feet. He falls over. <laughs> I said I might not finish him. Yes, that is correct. But he still has to, like, uh, he still has to make me feel like he's a good attempt. Even if I decide to put him aside because we keep doing the same stuff. And it's more, it's less that I get sick of doing metal than that uh, we just keep, it. it's repetitive for the stream. It's like when we were doing the dragons, like it was all scales all the time every day. Or every Wednesday at any, way, at any rate. It gets a little boring for the viewership. But yes, you are welcome to put clay feet on your own golem. I'm going to pass on that one. All right. And then black and brown. 
I dragged a whole bunch of uh, colors into the other room. And did I actually leave black and brown in the other room as well? Jeez. That's ridiculous. Well, fine. I'm going to use something else. Hello, Jarrett. Yes, it'd be something different, guys. But, you know, there's there's something different, like, that might look cool. And then there's something different that would be like, what? Like, like, if you painted this model with clay feet, would anybody understand what you were going for? Anybody who didn't, who didn't have you there to explain it? And also just why? I don't know. <laughs> like, there is, there is also, there, there is like the outside chance I do actually finish this model and, you know, give it to Reaper or something. At which point it needs to like probably look like, like, so Ron doesn't open it and say, what did you do at the feet? <laughs> Well, you could totally do that, Pendrick. But it the idea does not maybe cuz I I am not into I never know how to say that name. The Neb Nebuk guy. It does not resonate with me because I do not know it. And that is actually the problem with doing um, ideas that are a little bit out there or that are based on things that like you, the random person who's going to be looking at your mini wouldn't know. It's that even if it's a classical reference, uh, if their audience doesn't understand that classical reference, then they won't get it and they'll just think it looks kind of weird. I've always been, I guess, because I saw, um, I've seen so many people over the years who do a cool thing, but then like people just don't get it. It falls really flat. And I'm like, I kind of got, I formed a belief that on my models, like they should make sense. Like you shouldn't need me there to explain anything. So even though like this, uh, I mean, it's, it's a good thing to kind of a good example to hold up, especially with like ReaperCon, right? People do scenes and they are permitted to do a little like a book litter sheet um, that kind of says like, you know, the idea behind it and, and so on, um, things like that. But, you know, when the judges walk up, they're looking at the piece and then they're maybe going to get around to the, you know, to the write up you did. So if your piece is kind of confusing off the bat, they're going to, their initial, you know, reaction is going to be what? <laughs> so I kind of, uh, Try to make my pieces make sense, at least on an elemental level. And that's just a me thing, you know, you, you guys don't have to do that at all. Uh, let's see, what are we going to do? There's a lot, there's going to be a lot of glowies back here. A lot of stuff like if we're going to continue our, our motif, then the this side of thing. Right, but people, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit deeper dive on the traces than most people would go for. Or they, they just wouldn't get it. Like, they'd pass over it, right? They'd just be like, oh, I don't really like what she did with the feet. And then they'd move on. Like, I see people do that with miniatures all the time. Um, oh, wrong side, Anne. So I think we're going to do dark around here. This part's going to be the bronze, though. So we're using our colors again to block out the areas and kind of make sure we've got a good composition going on between the um, the glowy bits and the bronze. Make sure kind of we're alternating between the two. Yeah, that's fine, you guys. It's all good. He's not an iron golem, though. Like, he's not. He's a bronze golem. He's a really cool brown skeleton. But yeah, I mean, do it however you like. Like I said, do it freaking terracotta warrior and, you know, you you will be just fine. For me though, I really do uh, prefer a piece where you can at least get the gist. And then maybe like a little bit of the story can be explained aside.
And maybe I'm just boring. Like that can be, that that's possible. I could be boring. <laughs> Once I have a strong concept for a piece though, I go with it. I'm not up to changing it. And in the cases where I have had a strong concept and I have changed it in response to somebody else's critique or suggestion, without like exception, those things have, I've regretted it. I've regretted it afterwards. I've thought that it didn't look good or it looked kind of wonky or it didn't make sense. And so that is why sometimes when we are well into a model, if somebody suggests something that's kind of like off center, I am likely to just say, no, not going to go there. Because in my experience as an artist, when I do have a strong concept for a piece and I'm well into it, um, switching gears on it is kind of a mistake. I'm better off, if even if I'm bored, pushing through with my original idea, which I was happy with, knowing that once I get through the boring part, I'm going to be just fine. But yes, Pendrick doesn't need any help. Like I said, I used his idea yesterday. I was dubious about that idea, but because I didn't have a strong concept for Darius and what I was going to do with those areas, I was open to it and it turned out great. Much better than I would have thought. So it's not like I don't ever take people's um, ideas, but usually I'll ask or we'll, you know, be open to that when we don't, when we're not already like well into a project, right? But this guy, I have a very strong concept with uh, doing for doing um, from the beginning. I knew I wanted to do something like this. I mean, if it were me, I would have made it NMM and then the glow effect would totally work instead of kind of not working. But you guys wanted metallics, so we, we went that way. However, I reserve the right to do a crap ton of minis with NMM after this. <laughs> because I'm, I'm going to be metallicked out. Totally metallicked out. Alrighty, so uh, I left my black and brown in the other room too and I don't want to disrupt the stream, so I'm going to just use, um, I think I'm going to make those bronze. Uh, yeah. We've got a whole bunch of things here that look kind of similar, but I think I'm going to go with glowy here. And instead of black and brown, I'm just using um, ebony flesh, which is close, close enough. It really doesn't matter what you use to base coat your metallics as long as it's dark. The darker, the better. I would say no lighter than this ancient oak. Like ancient, the ancient oak is about as light as I would ever get under a metallic. Darker, usually darker, the better. Though I do not, I tend not to use black itself unless it's a very dark metallic. And usually dark metallics, you may not even need to undercoat, so. And usually um, using different colors to undercoat different metallics. Right now I'm only doing that. I'm doing that not because I expect the color to show through. It probably won't the way that I'm working but because I want to kind of block in each area and see, okay, this is going to be the darker metal. This is going to be the lighter metal. This is going to be um, the blue uh, kind of, you know, base of the model. So if you apply your metallics very thinly and you have a strong undercolor, Sometimes when you tilt the model, you will be able to see suggestions of the green or blue or red or whatever you're using. But the minute you start really building up washes and glazes and highlights, you tend to lose all that. So it's a very specific technique that would start with a solid color that you expected to preserve. And you'd probably have to leave some of it and not actually paint over it with the metallics. But in that case, what I, what I do is what I've been doing all along, which is coming back in with the verdigris colors and the greens instead of trying to leave them uh, underneath. Because again, if when we're using a wash treatment, like we've been doing multiple colored washes over all of this, um, you're going to just lose anything you leave in the cracks, especially if it's a dark color.
You may think metallics don't have coverage, but when it comes to more than one layer, they have better coverage than you give them credit for. Yeah, that's why I haven't given up on this model yet, Trojan. Like, he's still around. We are still, well, and I still feel like there's things we're doing on him that are not, um, you know, terribly boring. So we didn't finish out all of the skirt, but we'll get to that. And, and it's also that, you know, we're breaking up parts of it. Like we did one where we buffed out the face and we've done vertigree sessions that we've done, you know, the glowy stuff sessions and all sorts of stuff. So there's so far enough on him that I'm not totally frustrated with it. But there may come a point where I'm just like, you know what, guys, I'm just done with this one. Not feeling it. Haven't hit it yet. May not hit it. We'll find out. Maybe we'll end up finishing it. Maybe Ron will actually get this model in his collection after all. I'm sure that if Ron were here, hovering, he would want this model in his collection, were it done. So I'm just blocking in the straps on the underside of the arm with um, brown. Yeah, it is one out of six days, correct. Yeah, it only starts feeling repetitious for, like I said, for me when I'm doing metal and metal and metal and then some more metal, you know, which is fine. We shall see. All right, I mean, I reserve the right because, uh, because painting on a model that you really are not loving is such a slog and not at all enjoyable. Um, and I feel like it definitely carries over into the stream if I try to do it. I do, I always reserve the right to just say, you know what, we're not gonna finish that one, we're gonna start something else. Um, I'm not at that point with this model. But big projects are the, are the projects that is most likely to happen on. Because when I'm having fun with a model, I am definitely like just better on stream in general. Um, so when I'm happy with what I'm doing, I think everybody could identify with that. So by the way, for those of you who like the vertigree effect, and uh, if you are on my Patreon or considering joining, I am actually working on a $10 PDF right now on the colors of corrosion talking about the colors to use for different kinds of rust and uh, verdigree and corrosion on bronze and copper and brass. So those of you who are already on my Patreon, patreon.com slash painting big, I uh, can look forward to that hitting you if you are at the $10 level or above. Uh, I'm just doing some, uh, I'm finishing up the brass section now and I do give a little bit of color guidance on actual colors to use for the metals, but not as much. This is more about the corrosion. I do talk about copper a bit because that's one that's not done commonly. So um, this interior uh, area also is going to be, I think, kind of like the vents on the gloves. I want to get a lot of this actually blocked in today, so we'll do some glowiness, I think. Kind of felt in the mood to tackle those events on the gloves and the back of the model. Yeah, I mean, NMM is NMM. And although you can learn different things about NMM on every model, because, you know, it's always a different shaped surface and sometimes a different light source. Um, yeah. I totally get it. I mean, there was a reason I decided to, to do this guy in metals. That and he's big, so I feel like metallics look really good on him, whereas I don't think metallics look good on a lot of 28 millimeter. That and I like using the Reaper metallics uh, just to kind of put them through their paces and show you what you can do with them. Um, in some ways, they're not they don't act the same way as some of the metallics on the market, but you can actually get a lot of really cool effects with them as long as you learn what they're good at and how to work with them. Yeah. 
Yeah, there are very, there are a lot of colors that work very well for Rustin, and uh, patinas actually are very different. Um, like they they evolve, right? Because copper goes brown first; it doesn't go um, doesn't go to green right away. So it's it's uh, gradations. Like corrosion is always a a gradual process of buildup, and so. Let me see, where's my, do I have my blue? I don't right now. So we'll just do, what do I want to do there? Uh, I think I'll, I guess I'll go green. Yeah, that'll work. Um, so corrosion is never just one color, is I guess what I'm trying to say. Every metal has, a, has different stages that it goes through. And depending on the chemicals it's been exposed to, specific cause of the corrosion or you know what the atmosphere is like if it's like something near the seaside and getting exposed to you know salt and mist or if it's more of a chemical thing in a factory or it's on like an engine part and getting exposed to different stuff um, it can there can be a wide variety of color shifts I'm keeping this one fairly simple because a lot of the stuff, like like engine rust and stuff, um, which can, yeah, exhaust pipes can go almost pink. Uh, but that's like very isolated usage and not very use useful for a lot of Reaper models. So I don't really go into those. Maybe in a future PDF. It's more for car modelers. Sit, stay, brushes, stay. And you know, you could do worse, Quindy. You could do worse than some good old fashioned Sisters of Mercy. I like more myself. I'm a Sisters of Mercy fan. Andrew Eldridge has a totally sexy voice. So, you know, if we could, if we were approved to, like, do soundtracks, we could put on, like, Sisters of Mercy. It's pretty good painting music, actually. Large, flat surfaces. Use, actually, I, I talked about that on my latest video. Haha, <laughs> which will be going up on YouTube. Um, but for big, flat surfaces, use a big, flat brush. Just very, very... Briefly, Lord Nobody. Um, use as big a brush as you can while still be having control and being able not to, you know, slop a lot. Um, so as long as you can still hit the details you need to, use a brush. This is a very floofed out brush, but when it was, you know, in its prime, it was a nice flat, neat brush. But if you have a big flat surface, use a big flat brush. And if you are if you are patient for a week or so on December first ish or around there, I'm going to be putting up a video free on my YouTube that talks about base coating and talks about specifically this, like how to get a good coat on a big flat surface. Um, as far as painting big flat surfaces with details, are you talking about base? Or are you talking about details? What are you talking about? Tell, give us some uh, give us some context. What kind of big flat surface? And at what stage of painting are you? All right, let's see here. So we're good on that. Let's get some white underpainting. Let's get our metallics mixed up and block in the metal around it. And for our base of our bronze, which is that color right there, we are using three drops of ancient bronze, two drops of new gold to bring it a little bit more yellow, and pearl white one drop. So three, two, one. I'm gonna shake these up while we wait for Lord Nobody to tell us what kind of flat surface you're painting. Like tanks or something, something mechanical like that or something else. see here. I think we're shook up once you can see a solid color. But if, if you look at your metallics when you're shaking them, actually this is a good guide. You can see a lot of flake adhered to the bottom here. 
and you can see a slightly different color on top. What that usually means is you need to shake it a little bit more. Yeah, big flat brush for that and thin your paint a bit. Anything big and flat like that, um, thinning your paint is going to give you a lot of mileage on. Like I said, you'll, I'll have a video up actually on my YouTube about this shortly, but very, very, the two top tips are probably to thin your paint a bit and to use a, the biggest brush you can get away with. Um, if you don't have a big flat, use the biggest round you have. Like having a couple of bigger brushes on hand is a very good idea. for big surfaces, especially dragons. I find big flat brushes of a lot of use even painting like dragon scales. Yeah, those are big and flat wings. Hold on guys, I have a band-aid malfunction. I gouged my, uh, gouged my knee the other day. And sadly, my current pants are just not letting that band-aid stay on, so I'm adjusting. There we go. Adjusted. So in this one, we can see the same color on both sides, although we do see a little stronger color down here. Sometimes that'll be just because the flake has settled out and really adhered to the inside of the bottle. But if you're very close, the color here is very close, you know that you're shaking up really well. Um, did you thin your paint, Lord Nobody? Yeah, my YouTube channel, I'm starting a new series. The first episode got released to my Patreon patrons early last night. Um, it is about getting a smooth coat. And it has like four different tips for it. And like I said, it'll be public and free on the, about the 1st of December. I'm going to try to do one a month. The next ones will be about washes. I'm kind of trying to set up a fundamental series so that we can refer people to it for like basic questions in addition to the short answers I can give on stream because it's always more useful to watch someone doing it and I don't always have time or I'm not always at the right place on a model to kind of talk about it. Um, Nightmare Black can be a little translucent. Sometimes you just have to put two coats on. Did you only do one coat or did you do a couple of coats? Because even, I mean, if your paint is a little translucent and you're going on over bones, over bones plastic, then you often want to do another coat. And when you go, like if you paint, try to go in like with your brush strokes in one direction. And then if you have to go over it for a second coat, go perpendicular to that. So that you can, uh, that'll usually hide brush strokes. That's only for big, big flats. Like you shouldn't need to do that for small models. But yeah, I mean, it's possible that maybe the Nightmare Black, especially you do shake up that Nightmare Black, it does settle out. It's got a lot of high solids black pigment in it. And uh, that can absolutely uh, settle out a bit. But yeah, if you can still see some streaks, but the paint looks otherwise smooth, you can just see a little bit of the bones material maybe in places, just put another coat on, I would say. Sometimes it's just gonna take two coats. Uh, I need my mixing brush. Mixing brush, I need you. There we go. I do like this bronze recipe. I'll probably use it. Bronze, when it's fresh, can be, like, almost have a little bit of a, a pinkish tone, and that's kind of how this is coming out. I really, uh, I do like this color. And then you can just put a wash over it to warm it up a lot. Like, it's it really is a versatile. Like, I could also put washes over this that would emphasize the pinkish uh, color and go red instead. Oh, yeah, sounds like thinned way too much then, Lord Nobody. Yeah, five or six to one. You just want it a little thin. Like, yeah, you don't, when I say thin your paint, I don't mean thin it like extremely. For base coats on bones, you want it to be pretty solid, but you do want that water in it because the water does like make the paint capable of self-leveling when it's thick. 
So, and it reduces brush strokes because then all the brush strokes flow together a lot easier. That's why you add a little water, but you should only be adding a tiny bit. So like no more than four to one. And four to one, usually I will use on colors that are very opaque, like the brown here, where I know, like I just, I just did a four to one. These colors, both of these were four to one. So four drops of paint on the ancient oak and four drops of paint on the ebony flesh and one drop of water to each. And it's enough so that you get a nice even coat. Uh, that's entirely possible, Catnat. That's the problem with wet palettes is that they will absolutely wick more water up into your paint as you go. And that can be frustrating when you're trying to base coat bones. That's why I like my well. I mean, that's why that's entirely why I like my well palette because it lets me keep control and I know that the ratios are correct. Um, I do find frust I get frustrated at the amount of water that wicks up into my paint from my wet palette when I use it. So there are just some things I just don't even do with the wet palette anymore. Uh, let's see here. We want, so I want an old Raphael. But yeah, I would say, um, yeah, I'm, where's my, do I have nightmare? Let me see. I have nightmare black. So first of all, this is blue and black pigment. It's got a very heavy load of high solids pigment, but then it also has some regular pigment that's not as heavy. And so what that means is that over time, this color will settle out and you should shake it. Um, you don't need to put it in a, in a vortex shaker or anything. I mean, I just shake it regularly, but the key is when you take the top off and you squeeze a little bit onto your palette, if you see any clear fluid or any blue at all, like a flush of lighter blue, stop and reshake. Um, and with this color, let me do a, a test for you. So with this color, let's do a four to one real quick. One, two, three, four. Another uh, key to watch for is the viscosity. It shouldn't spread out a lot in the palette. You should see that it's kind of still sitting up. It's, it's fairly thick. And then when you drop one drop of water into it and mix it up, I'm going to say four to one is pretty good for this because the fact that it has the high density pigment means its coverage is actually okay. Um, so if we put this say over the base of, of this golem at four to one using a soft brush, it's pretty good. Actually, let's just paint it in. I usually paint the bottoms of bases dark anyway. So since I'm here, let's just experiment. So I am seeing some brush strokes. See them? So that tells me I can thin just a little bit more. So I'm gonna put just a little bit of water on my brush and mix that in. This is gonna impact my coverage, but it's gonna get rid of those brush strokes. And I wanna do this while the paint is still wet. Once it starts to dry, you're just gonna skin the paint up and cause blobs and uh, skin and like just horrible unevenness that you cannot recover from. And use a lot and Paint fast. Then kind of like look at it, see if anything is really, you can still see some lighter streakiness. So I'm probably, since it's still wet, I'm gonna apply just a little extra paint. But even so, even with that little bit of streakiness, once the paint starts to dry, I have to stop. I'm gonna say that's good. We can still see a tiny bit of streakiness, like if I look really close, but in general, this is good. Then you let it dry. And then I would put, like, I would actually drop even more water in and go over it with a second coat to smooth everything out. Because you can see that it has a little bit of an uneven surface still. That's just, you're on a big flat surface. It's flowing together pretty well, so I expect that it will flatten out just fine. Um, but this is where the airbrush comes in really, really handy. An airbrush would have been the best answer. Uh, but this will work just fine. D Sparrow, very little. Um, I, here I've got six drops of metallic paint and one drop of water, and that's perfect for a base coat. Also, like I said, you want to uh, seriously base coat. Like you want to base coat your metallics with a dark color. So if you don't do that, you want to. I just got blue on myself, and I got blue on myself again. <laughs> See, I got distracted, flipped the model around, and then I uh, fingerprinted my... Uh, 
my blue. One second while I fix that because the blue is still wet, so I can do that. So the thinner you go with your paint, the more you uh, get rid of these little, little, you can see the little bit of texture that my brush strokes have created. The more you'll get rid of that, but the thinner and more transparent your paint will be. So just keep in mind that a very small amount of a regular surface like this is probably gonna dry flat, no problem. And I've gotta take the paint off of my other fingers so that I don't get it all over our golem. This is the problem of painting the bottom and then flipping the model around to talk about a different topic is Anne gets paint all over her. Yes, you are probably using too much water, Dee Sparrow. You want a very tiny a bit. Very tiny bit. Like I said, a six to one is about what I do. And so it is thicker than my usual four to one that I use for regular paint. So as this dries, we'll go back and check on it. I'm gonna try hard not to uh, put my fingers on it again. I'm gonna come back here instead and start applying my bronze color to various places that uh, it should go. So it is a little, you can see that it even is a little thin, even over this dark color with that six to one. And that is like just, with metallics, if you don't add a lot of high coverage pigments to the actual color, you uh, have a hard time getting coverage with metallics. Because the thing about metallics is we want the the base to not, to, to be thin, because the more pigment you put in to a metallic to try to get coverage, the less shiny the metallic gets. Because the pigment starts interacting, it starts making the whole thing more matte because it's interacting with the gloss base. Uh, it also is covering up because it's particulate. It's actually, pigment is keeping the light from hitting the metallic flake. So the more pigment you have, the less shiny the color will be. So trying to formulate metallics with the traditional mica type bases that a lot of metallics use can be very difficult if you want coverage. And that's why a lot of metallic paints don't seem to have a lot of coverage. Um, in most cases, then the manufacturer is going for color and they are hoping that you're gonna use the dark base coat um, and just do a couple of coats. Uh, I've got a little bit of a string there, there we go. Now be aware metallics are a different formulation of base. They're slightly different. Uh, the base is usually chemically a very high acrylic and it will start to dry a lot faster than some of the thicker and goopier bases. Metallics do not layer, except for the bones metallics. Um, some of the bones metallics have such a fine flake that you can actually layer with them, just like traditional paint. And believe me, when I discovered that, I was like all over the moon with it because metallics otherwise are very hard to layer. You, getting it smooth is just not usually gonna happen. Like I'd have to see your models in person, D Sparrow, or get really good pictures to kind of uh, diagnose like how best to help you. Yeah, if you do the whole mix paint into it, that can help. But again, it's gonna dull down. Like Demi Metallics, if you're mixing uh, paint into it to get more coverage and to make it act more like paint, be aware that also, like I said, you're adding pigment, you're adding a different base, you're gonna have less shiny metallics. You can somewhat bring that back by putting a gloss sealer over the top, but because the flake is being directly obscured by pigment particles, you'll never get it back to as shiny as you would like it. That's correct, Quindy. So I would need to put that, I think I need to cut and paste your whole title. Everybody should do that right now. Then they, they can always address you by your correct title. So get a little streaky here on the first metallic coat. That is expected. Um, Wrangler, yeah, Wrangler of Bug Lips. I don't know if she's proud of that, Nemesic. 
<laughs> Goblin Wrangling is not nearly as elevated a title as uh, as the other titles in that in that uh, thing. So yeah, like expect your metallics to be a little streaky. Expect them to need a second coat. Like it should never surprise you when painting to need to do two thin coats, especially if you're thinning your first coat at all or you're dealing with a paint that's at all translucent. But remember, also with metallics, you're going to be applying other stuff. You're going to be putting maybe washes or painting shadows over them. You're going to probably be trying to highlight them with other metallics. And all of these things are going to even out this base coat. So getting a solid base coat with metallics is a good thing. But don't like overthink it too much. As long as it's more or less there, you can go forward with it. That's pretty good. So part of it is just like knowing the limits of what you're painting with. So, okay, down here, we're getting just slight. See, we can see a tiny bit of brush strokes, but then we're gonna go back over this nightmare black in the in an opposite direction and with another coat and it's gonna be fine. All right, so that's gonna be that, that's gonna be that. I think I'm gonna go here. Changed my mind on the color on this. I think I actually might want it a little bit. And if you want to thicken up your paint a little bit and even go like 12 to one on the uh, paint to water, feel free. Also, if you accidentally over thin, like you have a lot of water on your brush when you go and add it, dip it into the paint and you think you've over thinned your metallic, feel free to do what you need to, to rebuild the um, opacity. But in general, metallics, uh, metallics do not have great coverage unless they're dark metallics. And with Reaper paint, that's that essentially a dark metallic has a lot of extra pigment added to it. And that's why it's going to cover better. See, Grey Wolf knows. Grey Wolf's like, yeah, I just copy pasted that to my notepad and now I'll always have it so that when I address Quindy, I can use her proper title and get brownie points. So I'm going to just paint this in. Again, like I said, like I can see a little of the green through it, but not a lot. And that's fine. Like all paint has limitations. Like every color has foibles and things that it does well and things that it struggles a little bit with. Like, and that's just the nature of the beast. It's because not every pigment is the same. Not every flake is the same. Not every mix or color is the same. With metallics, I just expect to have to put two smooth coats on to get what I want. There we go. So yeah, I can see through this paint a little bit, but once it dries, like in the light, it's pretty darn solid. So I'll put one extra touch up coat on it, but if I can still see a little bit of like the base through it, I'm not gonna sweat it. I'm just gonna start working with it. Um, usually cartoon tongues are pink. But I, uh, it depends, like anime is more realistic than. Uh, 
and it's usually not like super bright. Like the best, the best way to do a tongue that doesn't look totally wrong is to mix a pink that looks close and then add just a tiny touch of brown or skin tone to it, Val. Just a tiny touch. The brown or the skin tone will make it look not like even, even cartoons have some bows to reality. Unless they're just way like pushing the color envelope intentionally to unnatural, which some of them do. So it depends. Breast cancer pink's a little bit, uh, again, a little unnatural. That's why I said that whatever pink you choose, like try adding a tiny, and I mean tiny, like just a little tiny touch of brown or a tiny touch of the skin color if you were using a natural skin color. If it's a very unnatural creature, like if it has blue skin or something, then, you know, you can, you can use a little license and an unnatural color is probably going to be just fine. Just ask yourself what you're aiming for. Because there definitely are more naturalistic cartoons versus, you know, um, Bugs Bunny. <laughs> So ideally when you thin your metallic, you can still see swirls, but it's not separating. If it's separating and you're getting like a watery layer over it, then you've thinned too much. Too thin. But yeah, for pinkish parts of anatomy, remember that the, like the reason it's pink is that there's a lot of blood flow under the skin. So the skin color is still there. And that's why I say add a tiny bit of skin color or brown to your pink for a more natural look because you still, you still have skin on your tongue. It's just that the blood flow is so intense there that, and it's so close to the surface that it has tinged the skin color pink instead of like you know, more yellow or tan or whatever you've got. Um, I would do punk rock with a little tiny bit of a brown, like, um, I don't know, I usually would use like russet or muddy or um, something like that, even earth brown, something like that. Um, rich leather might work. Just a tiny touch of that and a little bit of white. Drownable pink is not a true pink. It's a purple, so it's not going to work for this. Not unless you have a really weird colored uh, thing. And if it's it's also too muted, the drownable pink is way too muted of a color for most skin tones to work. Punk rock is, out of all the ones you just listed, the punk rock is by far the most versatile color. Like punk rock, you can add a tiny touch of white to, a tiny touch of brown to, and you can make a whole variety of pinks because it's a pretty pure color. But Drownable Pink has a lot of other colors in it, other pigments, and so it's very hard to make it work or to mix with it, unless you're already doing a very muted color scheme. And, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Pink is a fine pink, but it's already a, very light, so it doesn't give you as many options because uh, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to darken it to get it to be a good base color, which you can do by adding red or magenta. But um, Punk Rock Pink is a good all-round pink that's not particularly warm or cool that has just a little bit of white in it, so and it's a darker, so it's easier to shift one way or another. It's a lot more versatile. Yeah, I've never done the pink yellow thing. I get it, but just not just not really my shtick like I don't have a problem making yellows work. I guess I've I've worked enough with yellows. I like I tend to like to use the ochre 
use ochre to get better coverage or just go in with a little bit of white in it and shade down like watercolors but yeah there's so many tricks the pink thing certainly works All right, so now we got our back blocked out, except for our, we're missing our little blue, gunmetal blue uh, panel down below. But I do need a little bit more coverage on this, uh, the couple sides here. Oh yeah, if it works for you, it works for you. You could use, you know, I mean, it works because pink has a lot of white in it, so it's good coverage. And because it's, uh, got red in it and red is what you would add to yellow to shade with orange it, it works I mean it definitely works it's a good fast tip trick and the reason it works better than oranges themselves is because a lot of oranges don't have a lot of white added so they don't have that high coverage Nice and solid. Yeah, transparency is not a virtue in hobby paint usually. At least that's what people think. I personally consider it a virtue. That's why MSP has more of it than other lines. But a lot of people don't get it why why we made that choice there we go so I'm just putting a second coat on this real quick and it's just gonna make it a little more solid. But with every coat of shadow and highlight I put over this, it's just, it's gonna help to, if there are any weak spots or areas that are a little patchy, they'll disappear once you put um, a wash over it. Oof. Yeah, starting with four letter airports. That makes airports four letter words, officially. There we go. All right, touch-ups, all done. Sweet, nice solid, solid bronze coat. Look how different it looks compared to the uh, the washed portions on either side with just two washes. Cool, War Shadow, glad you like it. Yeah, I do fur with wet blending. Like, I just think it's, it's the no-brainer way to make fur, the base of fur work. Alrighty, I wonder if I've got my gunmetal blue right at hand. Hold on. Um, it, that little spot of back is annoying me. I do, yay! One of my favorite metallics. Totally underrated metallic on metal blue. Can get a, a wonderful, like, kind of blue steel, dark blue steel. And if you shade it with black, it makes great vampire armor. Highlight it up by mixing in pearl white. Oh, hey, we can put another layer on our uh, our bottom base. So you can see that it's a little bit streaky with the uh, Nightmare Black. So now I'm gonna mix, I'm gonna actually add another, I need a little bit more paint here. But it is still a pretty solid base coat down here. I'm gonna add a little bit more water. 
It's probably more like a three to one now because I'm not having to aim for coverage so much now. I want um, an even coat to make everything flow together. So let's see if we can do this. And I'm gonna use a big flat brush even though it's kind of poofy. And I'm gonna go against the grain. So whereas my original brush strokes were this way, now I'm gonna go the other way. And I'm gonna use, oop, I might have to mix up a lot more paint. Because I'm already going through it because this brush is sucking up so much. So that's one thing with a big brush. It will suck up the paint right away. That's pretty solid. And I didn't have enough paint, like it sucked it all up. <laughs> so we'll let that dry. And now I can use the Um, somebody had asked about using Nightmare Black Val um, because on a big flat thing, they were painting the wings of the Clockwork Dragon. So I was giving tips for painting big, big flat surfaces. And since they were having trouble specifically with Nightmare Black, um, I used Nightmare Black. However, I do paint the underside of bases black because I, then I sign them and I put the year that I painted them. So I actually do always underpaint my bases with Walnut uh, Pure Black or a similar color. And then I usually put my initials and the, uh, and the date on in white. And I got in the habit of doing this because when your pieces go into a gallery or even when you have your own collection and you just kind of wonder, hey, when did I paint that anyway? It's kind of nice to have the year or the month in the year that you finished a project um, written on the bottom of the base. And I find that it, the white paint against the dark just shows up better. And since we don't really want people to look at the bottom of the base anyway, painting it dark uh, makes sense. But yes, that is why, that is the whole reason why I paint the bottom of bases and I paint them specifically in a black or near black color so that I could use white. And the, night, and the reason I use white, the reason I do it this way and not the other way around is that when I thin white to the point where I need it to be so that I can legibly write a, a year and my signature um, or my little, you know, my little doodle that is my Anne signature, um, Essentially, white has high enough coverage that I can thin it to the point where I can do nice script, but it'll still have coverage, so, because it's white. So that's why I do it with dark with the white lettering instead of the other way around. That, and I always feel like undersides of things should be dark, so that there you go. Yeah, I mean, you can totally do the green self-stick pad thing just to give it a felt bottom. I mean, that always feels nice, especially with a heavier model. Um, but I, I just tend, to, I've never owned that stuff. So I just tend to paint, uh, to sign it and to make a note of the year, at least that I finished it. So anybody who buys a piece from me, like you'll have pretty much an autographed, um, and piece. And it'll also say, you know, what year it was done. All right. Let's see here. And I do it on commissions as well. Pardon me. I just noticed a mold line and it must be tackled because it annoyed me. I had to take the knife to it. So the key to getting Nightmare Black to be really smooth and dark on an area, and I, I thinned that second coat a lot. So I still maybe have a couple of areas that are just a little bit, a little bit lighter, but in general, once this dries, it's gonna be pretty flat. It's just the challenge of getting, I mean, the reason, the reason people use airbrushes to paint tanks is that when you have a big flat surface to get that wonderful, beautiful, absolutely smooth base, airbrush is where it's at. Um, you can do it with brush, but it's gonna take you like, if I was painting a tank in this, I would do another coat just to give it that absolutely rock solid, um, even base coat to make sure. <laughs> but yeah, when painting armor in general, uh, I think airbrush is where it's at. So I've got my uh, gunmetal blue here, which I love. I'm going to put just a little water in it because I only use three drops. Gunmetal blue is a dark blue metallic. 
originally created to be used to like paint blued steel. But as I said, the thing that I always love to do with it is vampire armor, especially if you're going with the red cloth. And if you use black to shade this, you can get some really awesome blue black armor going on for vampires. And it looks so good with red, especially if you're highlighting your red with orange. All right, there we go. Now I am not annoyed. Sweet, all right. Now we have that set. Let's do, I think I used magma red over the brown and then I brought it up to orange and lantern yellow. Pretty sure that's what I did for the uh, front glowy bits here. So I'm gonna get that out. We are gonna undercoat with white first. Gonna get my white out, thin it down about two to one, maybe even one to one. Let's start with four to three. You can thin white so much and still have it work. So we'll block in the glowy kind of thing like we have on his chest. We're gonna block in the hands, the little vents here, and we're gonna block in this back. I to get a lot, a lot blocked in today. So now that this is almost dry, it's pretty flat. Like if I tilt it, you can see a slightly lighter area. Part of that is that I did run out of paint. If I would have put a thicker coat on when I thinned it, if my brush hadn't decided to totally slurp it all up, um, I would have been able to do uh, a coat that was a little bit more even. But because I didn't have quite enough paint and I had to stretch it thin, um, then it wasn't as effective at uh, creating a smooth coat. All right, need a brush with a good tip, fine detail, good. All right, so here we're trying to say that toward the center of the model is hotter. Um, so we will probably make the cracks white on these gauntlets. Let me see if this is too much white. Essentially by thinning this paint, I'm trying to be able to layer with it. Create kind of a blended effect so I can paint the red over the top and have it be brighter down in the cracks. And I don't mind if it's a little rough because I'm gonna be painting other colors over it. So the fact that I see little lines there is okay. Probably could have gone a little stronger with this. It's at an awkward point where it's not quite gonna layer, but it's also not strong, not really strong. So we'll see. I think I'll make actually a little bit more. Where is my white? A little bit stronger. Yeah, thin layers are not gonna make you uh, get you, you a solid uh, base coat, Lord nobody. Actually, using it a little bit thicker is going to help. Like a, a more, use more paint, not less. That's a mistake I see a lot of people trying to get a smooth base coat. That's a mistake a lot of them make. More paint, not less. 
Again, I've talked about that in the video I referenced earlier that will be going up on my YouTube and is currently on my Patreon for all patrons. It's free bonus content for these new video series I'm doing. You guys get to see it before anybody else. But once uh, we hit, I'm going to try to do it like around the first week of the month. Every month, I'll put up a new one. It's about all I can commit to with my current work workload. So now we're making that line a lot whiter at the root. I thickened up my white paint a little bit so that it could be stronger where I needed it to be. And I'm going to paint that in the cracks between these. This is what you do if you want an interior glow effect is in the cracks. Instead of dark, you are painting light. or a radiating effect of any kind, like heat in this case. As I talked about when we first started doing this effect on this model, it's not as effective because we're using metallics. It would be more effective if we had done NMM. It is very hard to pair a real visual effect with a fake visual effect. Essentially, the real effect is going to always take precedence and it will never look um, Convincing, your fake effect will lose its convincing uh, ability. So I'm gonna come at this from the other side. You can all see why I have not painted the crest on this model yet, because I'm currently using it to hold the model. I can come at the, the white from the other side to blend it in a little if I want. So just as a reminder for everybody watching the stream because of American Thanksgiving, we will not be streaming tomorrow or Friday. We will be back on Monday. But yeah, base coating is very counterintuitive because you actually don't want a thin, uh, like, like when they say two thin coats, that's actually a little bit of a misnomer. Um, you do want to have enough paint on your brush that the paint will self-level and not leave brush marks. So I do feel like the two thin coats mantra is maybe a little bit misleading. You are using thin paint and you are using two coats, but the way you apply it is different. Do, 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 do. Just kind of trying to get this to blend nicely underneath. Just suggesting that. I won't spend too much time trying to make the underpainting even. Mostly I just kind of want it there. And then I can work it when I start bringing in the red. And we underpaint with white because we're going to be using glowy colors like reds and oranges and yellows. And if we try to put that over this dark brown, they won't look glowy at all. They'll look really dark and they won't cover well.
There we go. Ah, uh, no, it just looks like it. It just looks like it against all of the brown around it. War shadow. It's just white. So it's a it's an illusion. Though to be honest, it doesn't matter what white you use, but blue would be a bad choice here if you were using a blue off-white for this because you're gonna put red and orange over it, uh, which would be the complementary color, you know, orange is the complement of blue, so it won't it won't retain brightness. No, it's actually a visual illusion because of the colors right next to it, I think. it's uh, I can see it where it looks blue compared to everything next to it. I'm just going to come and bring this line back in. There. Excellent. Let's do some of the areas back here. I think I'm going to have the underlying areas. Hmm. Toward the center here, for sure. This will be interesting. Morning, Dr. Dewar. I don't know. It doesn't look white to me in person, but when I look at it up on the monitor, I can see where it could appear to have a blue shift. So yeah, you, your monitor may be accentuating. Um, and in fact, remember that all colors shift whenever they're, you know, in response to colors that are, they are next to. So this is next to a, you know, browns and oranges, essentially. So if it's gonna shift anyway, it's probably gonna shift toward blue, which would be the complementary color. Just a visual illusion, really. But it is pure white and it does not have blue in it. I kind of see how I like this. This is kind of an experimental area back here because it's not really constructed like the front area is. And I may regret deciding to do this area in the same kind of style. We'll see. Like, I kind of feel like I have to go out on the heat on the back spine because the peaked area is going to be farther away from the heat source, not closer to it. We'll see how that, how that looks, if it looks right. Sometimes you can do something that makes sense internally, but it doesn't look right to the viewer because it's not consistent with other areas, which is frustrating. And then you kind of have to, like, ask yourself, like, is this going to work here? Maybe I need to paint it a different way. So this is just underpainting, so we can make it really rough. We're going to cover it up with other colors. We're just using it to make sure that our bright colors look bright. Because they won't look bright if we put them over this dark brown. But they will look bright if we put them over the white. So are any of you guys starting to pre-cook for Thanksgiving today, those of you in the USA? I think I'm going to have to start my uh, homemade cream of mushroom soup tonight that's going to go into the green bean casserole. I just don't want to have to spend all day tomorrow cooking. I would like to have some leisure time. So I'll just block that in. I think I will try that, making it toward the edges here. You've been cooking for days. 
I have not been, but it's just David and me. It's not like it's a huge family thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you're vegan, makes sense. Yep, when you have dietary restrictions. I did pick up cra fresh cranberries at the store the other day so I could make my cranberry sauce from scratch. I have a recipe from a friend from a friend who had had that recipe in her family since her grandma. So. Ah, uh, yeah. We love leftovers too, but we have very limited freezer space at this point. So it's like, and we don't eat that much. Like David and I both try to kind of watch our weight. So we're both don't want to have too many leftovers. Like last time, last time I cooked an actual turkey last year. Like even with helping, even with Kiri helping to eat the turkey, um, we couldn't eat it all. Like we did end up actually throwing out some. So uh, I decided that I wasn't going to go totally that whole hog again. We just had Brussels sprouts last night. Yeah, I, I'm going through my list. I have on my to-do list today to... Uh, lay out all my ingredients today so that I can hit the store if I have to, if I'm missing something, but I think I'm good. I kind of have been kind of going over it in my head up to now, so we'll see. But yeah, I like having leftovers for at least an additional meal. But with my dietary restrictions, I actually eat very specific things for lunch and breakfast. So that means that my leftover consumption has to be dinner only, and that limits how much of it I can realistically eat. Oh yeah, I would like a chest freezer. Um, we've essentially have, uh, yeah, nice. So we, uh, now that we have a garage, as our garage gets cleaned out, we did kind of save space for an additional freezer. I might just uh, remind David that that was part of the original plan. Because we can certainly use one. Like right when we moved in for the first couple months, it was, uh, it was doable, but now our freezer is like full. I told him we have to eat things out of it for the next uh, week. But yeah, I would love a chest freezer. My parents had one growing up. Forty pounds. I can't do that. Because we're doing low carb, I'm uh, I'm making stuffing, but only a tiny bit, and uh, mostly doing the green bean casserole and the turkey and the gravy. Cranberry sauce isn't too bad the way I make it, since I'm making it straight from the cranberries and not using a version with a ton of sugar added. But yeah, that's a lot. Forty pounds is a lot, but when you have a big Thanksgiving, I mean, that's it's pretty cool. All right, so we've got this mapping in now, which is looking actually pretty cool. Kind of like it. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, I just have to be careful with my dietary issues too. So we all have stuff. My parents can't even do turkey anymore because my dad uh, developed an allergy back when I was still in college. 
Um, he just started having a reaction to turkey skin, to the fat in the turkey skin. And now any turkey will kind of just does, doesn't have it to chickens, but turkeys. So they do, um, they do different stuff instead. See, jelly, I've never really liked much, but when I had whole berry cranberry sauce for the first time, that was really tasty and well done. Mine has um, orange peel and ginger in it. It's very good. <laughs> I love it. And I can limit the amount of, I think it uses honey as a sweetener, but I can limit the amount, so it's nice. All right. Yeah, I do love my cranberry sauce. I was relieved that, that Sprouts had the whole berries yesterday. <laughs> Turkeys are scary. They're pretty um, primordial looking birds. Hey, Buglets. And now no one eats it because she made it healthy. <laughs> ah, that's funny. You know, the healthiest thing you can do to it is just not to use quite so much sugar in it. But yeah, I could totally see that. What have we got? We're getting down to it. I'm trying to get these uh, last bits mapped in. So we can do the heat stuff back here. Now the mapping in does tend to be a little boring, but yeah, cranberry sauce from scratch is, is really tasty. I mean, the biggest problem with it is that I end up having so much of it left over, but I do kind of like just eating it with things, so. Yeah, he never has any. Yeah, I don't know. They're probably like probably pretty hard to find these days. All right, we have got this almost all mapped in. You guys and your Skeksis Thanksgivings. Just a little bit, I think, of wet blending over here to make this work. Once again, you can be really rough when you're bringing in, like when you're underpainting like this. You do not need to have smooth layers. You just need to get a little bit of transition. Hawaiians have been eating manicure poop for ages. Like spam is all the rage there. I just thought spam was kind of gross. There we go. So we've got our bag. Oh, we missed one spot right up here on the top. I have no idea what spam is made from.
there we are get that last section kind of underpainted on then we can make all of these white areas be like our orange like hot areas on the front next time we didn't finish our little bits on the side here or the we did get the back though so the back will be good and then we can throw washes onto stuff and finally get some of this uh, looking like you know the stuff we kind of want it to look like instead of kind of sitting there unpainted uh, so that we are looking better on the entire top of the figure since he's uh, coming together coming together But yeah. Boom. There we go. So we're at least finally getting the back blocked in, which is good. Oh, I forgot to totally do this collar up here. More tiny little filigree things. Oh, well. We'll have to mix up our color again to do the edges on these uh, little bits and also to get more of the feet done and all that. So we will be back with our, our bronze collar color to uh touch up this area up here we have really the whole head yet to do i'm still kind of debating on some of it although actually you know what i wanted to think about hmm. yeah i wondered if i could make kind of a heat vent air effect here i don't know if that's going to work Yeah, I don't know. Heads, I'm not like entirely like happy with the head. I'm not like entirely into it. Mostly because it's bent over so you can't do a glowy effect on the eyes as much as easily. But uh So people used to call this the erase button. When you use thin white paint, you lay it down over a color to block something in and then you don't like it. So you just take your brush and get it wet and just scrub it off. Works much better with Vallejo because Vallejo doesn't have the adhesion of Master Series. Master Series, if it's dried, I actually have to like work at it a little bit, but it does come up. And now it's all gone. Ta-da. All right, so what we did today, wow. We, uh, we blocked in a lot. We decided we wanted to start working more on our hot sections of the model. So we're going to be doing the gloves, the vents and the gloves. And then we're also going to be doing a lot of area on the back just to kind of spice things up back here and make it more visually interesting. And also to kind of emulate what we did on the front because the design here of kind of the wires with the overlap uh, it was a lot like the design back here, which is why I decided to go that way with it. And... Uh, so, and then we laid down some metallic areas to kind of frame those areas. We did our underpainting so we could do heat. Uh, so all in all, we actually did a lot to block in the back part today, uh, which is nice because that's been kind of sitting there unpainted for a long time. <laughs> is there a Luca today? So, uh, so yeah, so that is what we did today. And let me get this guy in focus. Um, Tomorrow we are off. We are off Friday. On Monday, Monday we will be back with Noli. We will be uh, working on his stripy pants. Uh, we will probably also bring in his red sash and start really um, working on it. We did some cool weathering on his leather on the back last time uh, and a little bit on the front. Although there's not enough room really to do a lot on the front. Uh, so yeah, so we'll do stripy pant highlights uh, to make his pants a little bit more stripy and we'll work on the sash and we'll try to figure out what color we want this bag to be. All right, everybody. Yes, I hope everybody in the USA has an awesome Thanksgiving and anybody else who's having fancy dinners over the weekend for whatever uh, reason, I hope you enjoy them. Thank you everybody for coming out. I do want to say I will probably do my stream on my uh, Twitch, twitch.tv slash painting big. Um, I'll do that stream on Saturday around 3.30 p.m. USA Central Time. So I'll probably hang out, do paint club, work on a project, uh, and see you guys then. All right. Thanks for the shout out, Quindy. Oh, gosh, all the birthdays. Didn't Dices just have a birthday? Crazy talk. All right. You guys have a fantastic holiday weekend, and I will see you on Saturday, hopefully. 
um, or Monday.